Hey guys, my name is Wormsite, and I bring you something a little bit different for this bonus episode of the Battlespot Factory. Now, as I've been going on during the past uh, few episodes or so, uh, I lost a couple of recordings due to no microphone audio that was being recorded. So I'm going to bring you some of the games that I played on those episodes that I think are really interesting and uh, are good quality. Uh, the first game is a really close opponent from this Japanese player, rated 1543. Uh, the other is a team that I'm really excited to showcase for you. But jumping back into this game, our opponent has a team of Porygon Z, Mimikyu, Tapulele, Oranguru, Drampa, and Feromosa. Uh, so this team is a very uh, got two very contrasting cores. We got a very trick room orientated setup with the Mimikyu the Oranguru and the Drampa as its main form of offense. We also see a very offensive core and a very fast setup with the Feromosa, the Tapulele and the Porygon Z. Uh, the Porygon Z being a particularly interesting Pokemon because of its uh, ability to use a Z conversion, uh, which gives it a stat boost of one stage in all of its main uh, stats, uh, which does make it a real difficulty to take down. So going into this uh, team preview, I've got to be very wary of the Tapulele being a lead from my opponent, as well as the Feromosa. I don't want to send out Raichu and Tapakoko straight away, uh, because it will mean that the Psychic Terrain goes up rather than my Electric Terrain, and that will mean that Feromosa outspeeds both my Raichu and my Tapakoko. So I'm going to lead Raichu Salamence with Tapakoko and Gigalith in the back. The idea being Salamence will switch out on the first turn for Tapu Koko if he decides to bring his uh, Tapu Lele uh, straight away onto the field. And this should mean that the Raichu is able to get a fake out onto the Feromosa if it leads, as well as then outspeeding the Feromosa in subsequent turns. So as we jump into the battle here, um, I'm feeling somewhat confident the Giglyph is also there as a backup in case he decides to bring his Trick Room mode straight off, but we do actually see the Feromosa and the Tapu Lele lead. So this first turn, while the Psychic Terrain does go up for my opponent, uh, I do have the option of bringing in the Tapu Koko straight away for the Salamence as I had planned, and that will mean that my Raichu can get the Fake Out onto the Feromosa stopping it from doing any damage this turn and it also weakens any potential psychic type attacks that my tapu, uh, that my opponent's Tapu Lele may decide to bring out onto the field. Excuse me. This means that in this next turn I can then go for a psychic type attack into the Feromosa, potentially knocking it out and Tapu Koko can get some decent damage onto the Lele with its choice specs. Uh, under the electric terrain. So we do see the Raichu does get a very clear fake out onto the Feromosa, not expecting the switch in, uh, as the Tapu Lele does in fact go for a Dazzling Gleam, doing respectable damage to both of my uh, Pokemon on the field. You know, Raichu taking exactly to half health as Tapu Toko takes around 40%. <laughs> so this next turn, I want to take the Feromosa off the field as quickly as I can. Uh, because if it's left there for any significant amount of time, it can rack up some damage, possibly uh, get some very significant beast boosts, and then uh, go through my team like a hot knife through butter. So I'm going to shatter the Psyche with the Raichu into the Feromosa slot, and I elect a Thunderbolt with the Tabu Coco rather than doing a Volt Switch like I may be tempted to. Uh, obviously the Shadow Psyche is a safe option going into the Feromosa in case it decides to protect as its weak defences mean that even through the protect the Shadow Psyche should still pick up the knockout onto the Feromosa. We don't see any protect so we could have just gone for a plain Psychic into this slot which m would have preserved our C move. Something that uh, may, that could potentially have saved us further down the line as the Tapu Koko does show that it's outspeeding the Tapu Lele, getting the Thunderbolt off. As the Tapu Lele does continue to use Dazzling Gleam, it knocks out the Raichu and takes our Tapu Koko into the Red Hell. So, with a trade for one for one, I feel that we've got the better end there. Uh, Feromosa being a very offensive threat. 
I decided to bring out Salamence rather than our Gigalith this turn because I'm not sure what my opponent will want to go for uh, to bring out on his side of the field. If he brings a, his faster mode options like the Porygon Z, that could be an issue. But if he decides to bring either Mimikyu or a Ranguru, the Trick Room is most likely going to come, but I want to be able to get Gigalith in for fa fairly quickly for free if I can. So we do see the Oranguru hit the field here, as our Salamence does intimidate both these uh, special type attackers. So we know that Tapu Koko is the fastest thing on the field here. Uh, we can therefore take out the Tapu Lele. And our Salamence is very free to go for a Draco Meteor onto the Oranguru. Should do fairly decent damage to it. I was expecting around uh, 50% uh, to come off onto the Oranguru. We could have played this turn a bit more interestingly. We could have gone for a Thunderbolt and a Draco Meteor into the Oranguru to try and stop the Trick Room, but that would have meant that Tabulele would have got a free Dazzling Gleam off. It would have knocked out both of our Pokemon on the field, so it was necessary to target the Tabulele with at least one of the two and remove it from play. As we do see, the Draco Meteor does under half the Oranguru, showing that it's very specially bulky, as the Oranguru does set up the Trick Room, uh, therefore hinting that the Drampa from our opponent is in the back of, in the back for my opponent, as we do see it hit the field here. So I'm three Pokemon to two up at this stage, and I don't feel particularly threatened at this stage, even though the Dramper does underspeed all of my Pokemon, save for the Gigalith in the back. As I expected the Dramper to go for a Draco Meteor into the Salamence and the Rangaroo to just uh, potentially Psychic into the Tapu Koko, it would have picked up a double knockout, but my opponent very smartly goes for the Hyper Voice here, getting the spread damage. Uh, Tapu Koko does faint and it does just under half the Salamence, but the instruct here from the Oranguru means that a single target Hyper Voice will knock out our Salamence. And from a 3 2 lead, we go uh, two Pokemon to one down. Um, we haven't seen what the item is on the Dramper here, so. Uh, the damage output that the Hyper Voices were doing onto the Salamence suggests that it's not an offensive type item, such as a Life Orb or a Choice Specs. So I feel fairly comfortable with Gigalith being able to take whatever offense uh, the Dramper and the Oranguru has still at this stage. I am going to Rock Slide into uh, my opponents. If we get a flinch on any at any stage here, we'll be able to stop some sort of offense coming out from my opponent's side of the field. And three rock sides should be able to take out Dramper, and two should uh, knock out the Oranguru. So we do see the rock side come out, uh, doing just under half to Dramper and taking Oranguru into range of a further rock side. But we see that the Dramper here has the Dragonium Z uh, crystal which means that it can unleash a devastating drake onto our Gigalith. So it's this really powerful move. It does show that the, uh, the Dramper does have a uh, Draco Meteor as its uh, other move. Not even a critical hit there, so even through our Assault Vest, that does a lot of damage. As the Oranguru does go for the Thunderbolt onto our Gigalith, and the Gigalith survives with one HP of health. So this turn, it's all about flinches. Uh, as long as the Oranguru is hit with the Rock Side, as well as the Dramper, we should be able to get a situation where if we get a flinch, we could still possibly clutch out this game. There's not much else that I can do it at this point. So the Rock Side does fortunately hit both of our opponent's Pokemon. Uh, does knock the Oranguru out and does take the Dramper down to about 20% of its health. But the Dramper very smartly going for the Hyper Voice, it does not flinch, takes out one sole remaining HP of health from our Gigalith, and we do lose that battle there. So, 
one of the key turns there is we could have probably switched in the Gigalith for our Coco while the Coco was still alive. Um, under the first turn of Trick Room there. Uh, if we'd switched out the Coco into the Gigalith, taken the Hyper Voices. As we saw, the Hyper Voice was doing less than half the Salamence. And that meant that if we could have got a secondary spread attack from the Drampa, we might have been able to get a follow up Draco Meteor from the Salamence into the Drampa, which would have done significant amounts of damage. And that would have meant further down the line our Gigalith would have been able to use a Rock Slide uh, and that could have potentially sealed us the game there and then. Uh, however, hindsight is 2020, so we do take the loss there for our first game of this bonus episode. And as we go, we're going to try and find a second opponent and obviously this team is going to be a real humdinger for uh, people. Uh, so we just lost this game, um, trying to contemplate it, and it was quite a fair weight actually by the look of it. So going into this next game we're trying to obviously consolidate uh, our position by getting a second, a second game win. It's really difficult to underestimate opponents here, but this is probably one of those games where I did underestimate my opponent for his choices and didn't really consider the potential havoc that my opponent's team could cause. It's a Japanese rated oppo uh, Japanese opponent with a rating of 1577 with a team of Tauros, Gigalith, Milotic, Tapu Fini, Celesteela and Seeking. So, two Pokemon really stand out on this team, the Tauros and the Seeking here. Uh, some things that we have to keep in mind, the Seeking can learn Lightning Rod, um, and the Tauros could either be an Intimidate uh, Pokemon, or it could have the Anger Point ability, which means that if a critical hit, uh, if a hit damages Tauros and deals a critical hit, it raises its attack stat up to maximum, so plus six there. And looking at the team, there are options where this could happen. So I do have to be mindful of what the Tauros could potentially do. The Seeking, of course, is a real interesting Pokemon to deal with. Under normal circumstances, electric type attacks would be very effective against it, so uh, we would deal with it normally, but we have to consider that the Lightning Rod is there. And as we're going to see in this battle, it's not something that I keep in mind all the way. Obviously, Seeking has done very well at some of the more recent um, mid-season showdowns and special events over in South America. I know that there was a Seeking that got into third place on one of the various opens over there as we do jump into this battle here. So I'm going to the Coco and Katana. Katana being a very important Pokemon on our team in order to deal with many of the threats that my opponent has with the Milotic, the Tapu Fini, the Gigalith and the Seeking all weak to Katana's Leaf Blade here. Uh, but my opponent smartly leads with Tauros and Celesteela as we lead with Kartana and Tabakoko. And we do see straight away that, as the electric surge hits, that the Taurus is an intimidator rather than the anchor point. So we can now discount one strategy that this Taurus could potentially have had. So going into this turn, do you have to be mindful that the Seeking could switch in to take the lightning, uh, to take any potential electric attacks uh, with the lightning rod? But I do play this turn extraordinarily riskily by Thunderbolting and Sacred Sorting into the Celesteela. Now, normally a Tapu Koko onto a Celesteela with the choice spec does well in excess of 80% uh, to the various regular Celesteela that I've played in many times before. 
and even under an Intimidate, this means that Cartana's Sacred Sword should pick up the knockout. But we see here Celestia surviving with about a third of health as the Taurus goes for a Bulldoze onto our Pokemon, reducing the speed of both the Tapu Koko and the Cartana here. Cartana does get its Sacred Sword off, but with the bulk that the Celestia has shown, it's able to survive relatively comfortably as the Cartana takes a Fire Blast from its troubles and is knocked out. And immediately we've got a massive problem on our hands. So this Cedar does get a Beast Boost in Special Attack, and this I think confirmed my suspicions after the Thunderbolt was taken so well that the Celestia could have been a Assault Vest set. But critically, the Katana is lost on the first turn, and with my opponent's team being so extraordinarily weak to Katana, it's a major blow, and it does mean that we got a severe difficulty in getting back uh, this lost momentum, basically. So Salamence does hit the field, uh, does lower the attack of both the Celestia and the Tauros, probably not doing all that much to the Celestia given that it's shown that it's a special attacking variant. So this next turn, I don't really want to switch out Tapu Koko. I do believe that I need it for getting offense and I'm torn between whether or not my opponent will switch either his Tauros or the Celestia into uh, the Seeking here. Uh, we do see that my opponent switches out the Celestia, so he is going to lose that Beast Boost that he uh, accrued. He does go into the Seeking though. Uh, so this means that our Thunderbolt that comes out from the Tabu Toko is negated, as the Taurus does show that it has the Normalium Z and will use the Breakneck Blitz. This will go onto our Tapu Koko, and surprisingly enough, uh, the Breakneck Blitz does not pick out the knockout out onto the Tapu Koko, even despite taking chip damage. Uh, the attack drop taken from the Salamence means that it survives with one hit point of health there as the Seeking does take a flamethrower but as you can see not very effective as the Thunderbolt is taken by the Seeking. Going to boost its special attack which will be significant later down the line as the Seeking also shows that it has leftovers. So the Seeking is obviously a very bulky set and this does raise some concerns with me however we still do have our Z-move, and I'm fairly confident that Salamence with the Dragonium Z can knock out a Seeking with a full strength uh, um, Draconic Rage. And with this in mind, I take a bit of a gamble uh, by trying to Thunderbolt into the Tauros, hoping that perhaps we might be able to get an attack off onto it. The Taurus does show Pursuit, so obviously if we switched out the Tapu Koko, we would have been losing it regardless. As our Dragonium Z does go out from the Salamence, it will be targeting the Sea King, but as we're going to see, the Sea King... Oh, it's a Devastating Drake, I do apologise there. Um, will survive fairly comfortably here. Much to my surprise. So, as we see, the health bar does go down, but it's left with about 10% of health, and the Sea King does reveal that it has Ice Beam. This will take out our Salamence here, and already we're down 4-1 uh, in this game. Seeking and Tauros putting in massive amounts of work, and this is why you shouldn't really underestimate unusual choices uh, from opponents, because sometimes they can come back and bite you. So our last hit is Raichu. Not really able to do all that much. The the Tauros is still a massive threat. Um, I believe I just forfeit at this stage. I've I've already taken enough punishment. I don't really want to take any more. Uh, the Seeking and the Taurus have done tremendously well uh, in this battle, and it all really stemmed from the Kartana not being able to survive the first turn. We took a, a major gamble uh, by Thunderbolting and Sacred Swording into the Celestia, but with it surviving, uh, the combination of Tauros' Bulldoze, meaning that our speed was lowered on both the Tapu Koko and the Kartana, 
uh, breaking our focus sash, and then the fire blast obviously coming out from the Sutter Sealer. It meant that we were down in such a situation that we couldn't really recover from. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this bonus episode in these two battles. As I said, the, the team in the second battle is something really interesting and it does show that you can't really uh, plan for every occasion. The Taurus is something that you don't very often see at all and seeking hardly anyone will ever use. But this team pulled it off with a plum. So. I thank you guys for watching, I hope you enjoyed this bonus episode and again I say to you uh, do like, comment and subscribe down below, it's greatly appreciated and tomorrow we will we'll be moving on to uh, this new team on the Battle Spot Factory that I am planning to bring for you. I hope you will, will join me then tomorrow to uh, catch it but until then goodbye for now.